Every year, over 25 million humans voluntarily spend their vacay on one of these gigantic floating disease incubators. So what's the appeal? And how do cruise companies convince so many people to hop aboard? Well, apply some lotion and drop the kids off at the pool, because today we're looking at the business of cruise ships. But where did cruise ships come from? If you wanted to cross the big blue wet thing in the 1800s, you either had to be a migrating goose or buy a ticket on an ocean liner. These rust bucket marvels of industrial age innovation facilitated international trade on an unprecedented level. But shipbuilders soon figured out that one of the most profitable cargoes to transport was the squishy human kind. In the early days, ocean liner passengers would be crammed like human dominoes into rat-infested, disease-ridden dormitories. And these transatlantic journeys would take the better part of the week, with passengers having scant opportunity to ever set foot outside. I mean, imagine that. <sighs> But as cruise ships got bigger, they got trendier. People would show up at the harbour to wave their friends and families goodbye as they travelled off to faraway lands and occasionally into the face of a giant iceberg. Before long, it wasn't just immigrants hopping aboard, but also travellers with enough money to insist on being treated humanely. As a result, Cabin Class was born, a relatively small section of the ship designed to emulate the ambiance of a high-class hotel. These uppity upper decks often presented an exaggerated image of European aristocratic luxury, something that the American upper classes were travelling to experience. Unfortunately for them, most of these ships docked in Southampton, a British port city less known for old world sophistication and better known for its weird smells and ugly long-haired inhabitants. Ocean liners held a steady monopoly on transatlantic human dispersal until the 1950s, when it was suddenly made obsolete by the passenger jet. Planes like the Pan Am Clipper made air travel cheaper, safer, and sexier. By the 1960s, 95% of people travelling across the Atlantic were doing so in one of these smoke-filled fancy metal birds. A ticket for an ocean liner was suddenly looking as pointless as a ticket to Coachella in 2020. But as we know from the continued market for vinyl records and all kinds of print media, there will always be gaggles of nostalgia-addled suckers willing to pay extra for an outdated, inferior product. Ocean liners were forced to change course, figuratively and literally. Companies pivoted to more exotic locations and began selling ship life as part of the attraction. As this Kernard promotional film demonstrates, the main draw of cruising was the implication that you would be weighted on hand and foot like some spoiled oversized toddler. But of course, there are many pleasure activities that one can only experience on a cruise. There's sea shopping, nautical reading, ocean exercise, and that classic cruise staple, competitive floor sweeping. Um, on a boat. However, the cruise industry was still struggling to shrug off its stuffy old world associations. That was until 1977, when a surprise hit TV show brought cruising to a whole new audience. The Love Boat was a nauseating cocktail of stale gags, frictionless romance, and B-list celebrity guest stars. But it did have an opening song, which admittedly, absolutely slapped. Back to you. The show itself was unwatchable garbage, but it appealed to the middle-class, middle-aged couples whose idea of a good vacation involved as little movement and as few surprises as possible. These ham-featured couch creatures would quickly become Cruising's new target demographic. And for over eight years, Love Boat ran as an inadvertent but highly effective primetime commercial for Cruising. Today, cruise ships are an incredibly lucrative industry. Well, they were until very recently, but we'll get to that. Roughly 75% of the market is controlled by only three companies. That's Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian Cruise Lines. So let's take a look at the biggest, Carnival. Carnival, also known as the Fun Time Ship, is littering the ocean with over 100 vessels. And their fleet includes the Symphony of the Seas, the largest cruise ship in the world. This gargantuan sea slum can accommodate nearly 7,000 passengers, and that's not including over 2,000 members of staff. And they're also fronted by their mascot, Fun Ship Freddy, a terrifying disposable razor who looks like he's planning to murder you in your sleep. But he's meant to resemble the cruise line's signature sulfur-spewing whale tail funnel, which leads to the inevitable question of what comes out of the big red thing? Well, obviously, it takes a whole lot of ground goo to shoot a shopping mall across the Atlantic, but it takes a particularly toxic brand of the black stuff to do it. Heavy fuel oil. 
the average 2,000 person cruise ship burns through 1,500 tons of this stuff every day. And most of the waste produced from burning this oil shoots straight out of the ship's gigantic red fart pipe, producing the same amount of particulate airborne pollution as 5 million cars covering the same distance. And considering that there are 314 of these things bouncing around like snooker balls on the ocean's surface, that's the equivalent of fucking loads of cars. But firing a floating city-state across the world also burns through a lot of cash. So how do these companies turn such a massive profit? Well, first of all, these ships almost never leave port until they filled every cell on their gallivanting gulags of organized fun. So while Norwegian cruise lines like to advertise their communal areas like this, they will almost always look like this. The only time you're likely to get some private pool time is when someone's snotty-nosed kid has done a sick in it. But the cruise industry also has some rather ingenious money-saving techniques, and none of them are as effective as flying a flag of convenience. You see, 90% of cruise companies operate inside the United States, but all of their ships fly the flags of other countries, usually either the Bahamas or Panama. Countries that, let's say, have a hands-off approach to taxation. By stapling these correctly coloured pieces of fabric to their ships, these Miami headquartered companies pay an average tax rate of 0.8%. It's a loophole so wide that you can ram a 50,000 ton passenger boat through it, or in fact, a whole fleet of them. But waving these flags also gives cruise companies another discount on the amount that they have to pay their employees. This way, they can avoid pesky things like the US minimum wage and other laws governing the labor market. The average cruise ship worker makes less than $2 an hour, with many of them also working 11 hour days, seven days a week. With all these legal privileges, these flags of convenience make James Bond's license to kill look like a subway loyalty card. But it's not just the cruise companies getting away with murder, it's also the guests. Not committing any crimes on a cruise ship is like going to Vegas without your Mexican attorney and a suitcase full of psychedelics. You might as well not have gone at all. A side effect of these flags of convenience mean that any crimes committed on board fall under the jurisdiction of countries that are often thousands of miles away. So investigations either don't happen at all or are conducted by staff who have absolutely no training in dealing with a moida. Cruise ship crime is underreported, underinvestigated, and deals are often made under the table, which also makes it very difficult to get reliable data on any of this nautical naughtiness. But it isn't just murderous passengers you have to worry about, there's also a dangerous form of stowaway, the microscopic kind. In January 2014, an outbreak of the highly infectious norovirus infected over 15% of passengers aboard a 4,000 capacity Royal Caribbean cruise liner. Now, if you're not acquainted with norovirus, first of all, you've lived a blessed life, you sweet summer child. It is a delightful little illness that'll make you do a sick and soil your britches simultaneously. For about 48 hours, you are transformed into a human fire hose, and all you can do about it is hold on to something porcelain and wait for it to be over. So imagine you have just caught this highly infectious illness, and you are one half of a couple sharing a bedroom and a bathroom. Now imagine you're one of about a thousand couples going through the same thing on one oversized boat. Now you've got the picture. That's what one of these norovirus outbreaks looks like. And there have been 353 of these gastrointestinal singularities in the last 14 years. Wash your hands, it's the right thing to do. And that's why any large cruise ship will continuously play these earworm jingles to make sure you wash your fucking hands, lest you turn your booze cruise into a poos cruise. Now, you might be aware that a certain ongoing global catastrophe is having an effect on cruise ships. In fact, they're in big trouble. Any ship that isn't prematurely docked is currently stranded at sea because they have infected passengers and countries are a little reluctant to let them port. 2020 was projected to be the cruise industry's most profitable year ever. But now Carnival and Royal Caribbean are begging for corporate bailouts from the very country that they haven't been paying tax to. But here's the thing. The big three companies have relatively strong balance sheets. Even with no revenue, these companies have enough cash to stay afloat for six months. However, like a certain brand of barely drinkable piss water, there is uncertainty that cruises will ever be able to shake the stink of, um, that big thing that's happening to all of us. 
the cruise industry has been on a no-tax vacation for its entire existence, and is about to experience some old-fashioned free market economics. So I think these floating favelas may sink or swim, but they should do it on their own terms. Hello everyone. Don't worry, it's just me, this dude. This is for the next episode, which is going to be all about the secret history of masks. I think you'll love it, so you should subscribe and hit the bell so the next ordinary thing can be delivered straight to your unmasked face. I'd also like to take this time to announce that I'm going to start twitching for your pleasure on the platform known as Twitch. I'll probably be playing Yakuza or something to while away these self-quarantine hours and the horror that they're bringing on my brain or whatever. I, this is improvised. I usually speak on script, so this is strange for me. Anyway, I'd also like to thank my patrons. You guys are the best. You keep ordinary things going, and without you, I wouldn't be able to afford stupid shit like this. So, thank you and peace out.